So I know I had mentioned on the email originally, but just, you know, as a little bit of background. So um, I finished my dental residency about a year and a half ago. Uh, and so I ran a practice and I was kind of looking for some way. I've always been super into health and fitness and all that. And so yeah. you know, now that I was out of school, this was kind of a, a way for me to still be involved in that. And then I have that charity aspect of it where I make sure to donate. And I've had it two different ways where I either donate for each one a certain amount or yeah. I've actually just kind of accumulated stuff from like, you know, things that I've gotten from YouTube and advertisements. And then I will just do like a bulk donation. And that's included like St. Jude's or if you ever heard of Operation Smile, they help children with cleft lip and palate surgeries. Oh, yeah. OK. So things like that. Um, and, and so basically it, there's been a, a wide array of guests. So I'm really glad we were able to get you on. Um, the way I normally start is I'll just kind of give a, a little intro to you. I'll just say welcome. And then I'll just, you know, if you could just give like a minute long background or so, and then we can get into the questions. Okay, fine. Perfect. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All righty. Sure. And it's Lithgow is how I pronounce it? Lithgow. Lithgow, Okay. All right, everybody. So today we have Dr. Gordon Lithgow with us. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. So I'm really glad we were able to get you on and coordinate this. I had actually seen you on another podcast, Dr. Rhonda Patrick's podcast. Um, that was a little while back, and then that kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of some of the other stuff that you've put out. So you know, you are pretty much an expert in longevity, and you study longevity in uh, different elements like uh, C. elegans. And I was just curious, how did you even get into that in the first place? Oh, I was sitting on the floor of a library in Switzerland in a pharmaceutical company. And uh, it was late at night, the place was empty, and I opened a science journal. And I came across a paper by Tom Johnson, University of Colorado. And I didn't quite understand it, but when I got to grips with that, I realized he'd found a mutation in a, in a single gene in this tiny nematode C. elegans that extended lifespan by a huge margin. And I just thought that was the most unbelievable thing. I'd never heard anything like it. And I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Tom's lab. And that was my introduction oh, wow. to aging, is studying lifespan in, in those tiny worms with uh, long-lived mutants. That's awesome. And so how long have you been kind of studying that specific topic, longevity itself? Yeah, it must be 30 years now. It's incredible, you know, and, and mm. I must admit when I when I got into it and it was purely curiosity driven, it, the, mm. the idea that these animals could have a plastic lifespan that you could m make a genetic manipulation and it changed aging, I just thought was amazing. And what I thought would come from that was an understanding of aging processes. And that's essentially what's happened. Uh, what I didn't expect was we'd get to the point where we're talking about humans. That's yeah. a real shock to me again. Right. And I'm sure, you know, everybody, everybody listening to this podcast is probably a human. And so that's, that's where a lot of the interest <laughs> is. Um, but I guess I'd want to start with saying like you, so you vetted a lot of different compounds, right, over the years to see what works for C. elegans. Um, how do you even go about that process? Is it literally just giving them the compound and seeing what happens? Yeah, I mean, initially we thought, well, if you can pull off a genetic manipulation that extends lifespan, and why can't you find a small molecule that does the same trick, you know, by perhaps inhibiting a protein that's encoded by that gene or whatever. And um, so I think for years people were squirting compounds on, on worms to see if anything happened. And it was only in, in 2000 when it came as a suggestion from Simon Melov. He'd been working on antioxidants, uh, a particular powerful class of catalytic antioxidants in mice and uh, he said you should try these Gordon and, and we did and they worked uh, they gave up you know 40 percent lifespan extension or more wow. uh, very exciting at the time sent it off to science science accepted it extremely fast because this was uh, really the first time that anyone had seen a small drug-like molecule extending lifespan of mm -hmm. an, an animal so um, that was exciting and, and actually it wasn't it wasn't plain sailing from then. We actually had some trouble in other labs replicating those discoveries. And um, for a while, I stepped away from, from compounds. But we got back into it. And there's really two ways to go about it. You can basically say, we don't know what's going to extend lifespan. So let's just look at as many compounds as we can. Yes, you might want to look at drug-like molecules because then you know that that might be of interest later on. But um, but we've looked at synthetic molecules. We've looked at natural products, the mm -hmm. kind of things we're exposed to in, in foods and 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 um, 
you know, across the board, we're able to find things that extend lifespan. So that the way you do it is to, to do a screen. You essentially expose these animals to the compounds throughout their life, usually uh, feeding them from when they're young animals. And uh, we have some simple tricks to reduce the labor costs and actually looking at these animals day after day after day. Um, and in the end, you find like anywhere from 0.1% to 1% of the compounds you look at have a, an, an extension in lifespan. Wow. The other, the other way is is to come at it with candidates. You know, you might be studying a particular biological process known to be involved in longevity, and there are known inhibitors or activators of that pathway, and so mm. you can come at it as a, with a hypothesis to say these these things should work, and that works as well. Many, many times, if you've got enough information on the mechanism, you can make some good guesses. And you mentioned there that there's some issue, or there was some issue, with replicating some of these yeah. findings. Uh, I know in the past you had mentioned that standardizing the protocols is, is obviously extremely important. Has that changed in recent years in terms of getting people to do more standardized protocols so you're finding more replication? I think so. I mean, this has been described as a, a crisis in science going back five years or so. Mm -hmm. um, this was started in some ways by some biotech companies and pharma companies not being able to replicate findings from academic labs. Now, there's a lot of debate about what was going on there, but it, it set off a, a train of events where people really started to think about replication. But this started very personally for us. I mean, this was my lab published this kind of major paper. And then other great scientists, you know, really good people who do really good C. elegans experiments, we, we couldn't tell them how to get this to work, mm. uh, in, including a friend of mine, David Gems, who I was at graduate school with. And, and that, so that was really confusing at the time and, and you know, just was quite dramatic that, that you can make a major discovery and then other people who you know are really good scientists can't get it to work. Now, I think what's changed is that there's an awareness that this has happened time and time again down the years. It's maybe especially in aging research, but there's certainly lots of examples in aging research. And um, the, the National Institutes of Health have actually funded a couple of different programs to look at this. And, and the way that we've, we're going about it is to fund research in independent laboratories. And those laboratories all try to find standardized conditions in which they get the same data. And so we've achieved this with two other labs, Patrick Phillips and Monica Driscoll. Uh, and we're funded under something called the Serenobditis Intervention Testing Program. And we have been able to find replicate, that, you know, da generate data that's identical in each lab and then go on and test compounds. And it, it's an interesting, complex story. Some things don't replicate, but for the most part, we can find them. We can find compounds that actually replicate in, in each lab. So that's, you know, going back to you know, 2000 when we first published that, it's quite satisfying now to realize that we have the ability to do this. Yeah, that, that's great. I, I think when people, even when they hear about, you know, certainly rodent studies, um, even sometimes primate studies, and of course, the elegant studies, there's a question of, you know, how does this relate to humans? And I think there are obviously examples where we see things that do not relate to humans. Could you maybe give some examples, and it doesn't have to be related to longevity, but could you give examples where we have studied C. elegans and that information has been useful for humans and has shown similar results in humans? Sure. I mean, you know, classically, um, you know, s cell death um, was a process first really studied in the worm. The first genes for cell death were identified, and then the, the homologs for, for those genes were then found in humans, and, and that 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 that's an award a Nobel Prize award-winning discovery that really did translate um, and in the aging sphere um, the, some of the very first genes that came out of the early experiments looking at longevity in the worm well when those genes were cloned uh, it was realized that they were actually insulin signaling response genes so they're part of the insulin signaling intracellular pathway and that was at the time very very confusing uh, it seemed to be the opposite of what we would have thought. We would have thought if you interfere with insulin signaling, you know, you were pre-diabetic or diabetic, and right. you know, it, it was just a bad metabolic idea. Uh, but it turned out these early mutations were tweaking the insulin signaling pathway in such a way that uh, it induced all sorts of other longevity factors, and so the worms lived longer. And one of those factors is a transcription factor, which in humans is called FOXO3A, and it's one gene, uh, the gene 
encoding that factor, this gene has been has been known for quite a while to be involved in whether you become a centenarian or not. And this this wow. study has replicated in multiple populations. And that that gene was first identified as a as an aging gene in the worm, and is now studied by people who are studying centenarians. We still don't know quite exactly what's going on um, at the mechanistic level, but uh, but it just goes to show that I think processes that we identify in really simple animals can be conserved all the way through to not just mice, but humans as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. And what was the specific gene you said that was uh, tied to whether someone's a centenarian? In the in the worms, the gene's called DAF16, and the, the, in humans, it's called FOXO3A. Okay. And that's probably so, you know, for those of us who have done genetic testing like 23andMe, if we've gotten the raw data, that's something that we could look for in there, you think? I'm sure you could, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the alleles associated with longevity are well known. Okay. And, and I said we don't understand the mechanisms because some of these are, alleles are not in the coding region of the gene, so we don't know how they're affecting mm. the protein levels or, or some other aspect of, of the transcription factor. But um, yeah, no, it's thrilling to see that kind of translation. And, and the, the other really big picture thing is that we now know of hundreds of genes in the worm that determine lifespan. And if you look at what those genes are encoding, it's, it's, it's mechanisms that we know are conserved. Yeah. Uh, things like autophagy, protein homeostasis, cell cycle. I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and I'm not saying that we don't stumble across something that's just about the worm sometimes. And sometimes that's so interesting, we study it anyway. Yeah. Um, but I think the majority of things that have been studied over the years in the scores and scores of labs that have studied aging in, in the worm, I think most of those are relevant, at least to mammals. Now, having said that, you know, we, we do amazing things in the worm by, by, with genetics, um, five-fold extension of lifespan, tenfold mm. extension of lifespan. With small molecules, we can double the lifespan of, of you know, the worm and uh, some other species as well. There's some debate as to whether, even though the processes may be conserved, whether you can really pull that off in, in humans. And part of the argument there is that we are much more complex even than right. the laboratory mouse. And um, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think what we're seeing in the lab right now suggests to us that we should at least try. Because, and this comes down to health, because it's not just about longevity, it's about the fact oh. that when we extend longevity, we're seeing additional years or months or days of health, right. and that's super exciting, and that's the thing that I never thought I'd be thinking about or talking about 30 years ago when we started this. Yeah, I mean, it's, of course, a really interesting topic. I mean, even for somebody like myself who's younger, I mean, you know, I'm 29, so it's not like I'm thinking I'm going to be passing anytime soon, although obviously you never know. But, you know, the idea of living longer is, I think, everybody's thought about at some point. You know, there aren't too many people who don't have an interest in that. I think, obviously, you're right that the extensions that we see in worms or even, you know, like rodents is, is maybe not right on the horizon for humans. You know, like you said, like these doubling of lifespans, you know, is probably not right around the corner in part because we're so complex, you know, whereas maybe for them, there's relatively small or few processes for us. I mean, you could just multiply that by a thousand or whatever it is. Right. Um, you know, the first time I really heard about life extension was maybe about 10 years ago. Um, just like in passing, I was just like reading articles. Yeah. And the main thing that I had heard people talk about was calorie restriction. And, you know, in my, you know, space of the fitness world, that's certainly a very common uh, topic. Now, I don't know too many people who would just want to live their, the rest of their life eating like, you know, very low calories and it could be kind of miserable. But is that something that we see originally in worms as well, where you just you don't feed them or you, you feed them a lot less and that extends their lifespan pretty dramatically? Yeah, it works. It works in most laboratory animals. There is a caveat to that, though, that if you take the mouse experiment, so people have been studying caloric restriction in rodents since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe like 15 years ago or so, there was a series of experiments that showed that this is highly dependent on genetic background. Mm. So, so uh, if you take a panel of mice with different genetics, you give them the same caloric restriction regime, some will live longer and some will live shorter. So really? there's actually, there's a lot of subtlety in there that we need to understand the interaction between the genetics and the degree of caloric restriction. Now, it be, may be that if you take those mice that live shorter and you spend a lot of time working what works for them, mm. then you could get them to live longer as well. Um, but that, that it, it's certainly conserved all the way from worms. You can do it in worms, you can do it in flies, you can do it in mice. But we do need to think about 
is it appropriate for for everyone at the same level you know and, and this goes i think for a lot of a future aging medicine and future ways to intervene in health span that we're going to have to pay attention to the responses of individuals to the to the treatments if this really is fundamental biology that we're altering and and it is it's, these are processes involved in growth and fertility and you know just all, all the good stuff and now we're coming in and intervening we need to understand how individuals are going to respond to those interventions sure yeah that's actually really interesting i had not heard i guess because i was looking at like average and like mean data so mm -hmm. i just thought that for the most part everything that we had tried caloric restriction and resulted in increased longevity i didn't realize that there were some that were actually decreasing longevity with that yeah, and, and you know, it's been known for ages that there were some laboratory mouse strains that just didn't respond at all. But then when these more careful studies looked at a panel of different mouse um, uh, inbred lines that with different genetic backgrounds that you, you see this um, amazing extension in some and amazing shortening in others. Wow, so that's, that's kind of risky. You know, you might not want to do the caloric restriction. You might be one of the unlucky ones. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, it, I, as I say, I think it's a general thing we need to think about with aging interventions is how appropriate is it for people and how appropriate is it for that person? Yeah, it's, it's personalized medicine, um, but sure. it's, it's something I think in aging we need to really pay attention to. I should say, if you don't mind me adding that, that sure. if I ask a room of, of people um, from the pub, non-scientists, you know, do you want to live to 120 or 150? There's very, very few hands go up, like maybe one or two really? percent of people. Yeah, and and if but if you ask the question differently and you say, you, do you want to live that long with the your faculties and your strength and your sure. energy yeah. of of yourself at fifty, every hand goes up. Right. And 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 so, you know, and I think it's really important. I think the aging scientists have got this that longevity itself is is not really the goal um, for many people in the field but promoting health to the point where you do live to 120 and 150 in right. good health is clearly a, a, a fantastic goal totally yeah I mean certainly if you were to imagine continuously getting worse until like 150 that doesn't sound right. so great after maybe like 80 or 90 um, right I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Peter Atia, uh, but he was also a guest on uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick's show. And yeah. something I had heard him, he referenced a study, I have not looked into it myself, but he said that there were basically these two groups of primates. And the one group, if they reduced calories for a, uh, for a group that had ad libitum feeding of their standard chow, I guess, yeah. they did extend lifespan. But when they gave them, and again, I, I apologize for not knowing the details here, but if they gave them reduced calories of an already healthy diet, they did not see extension of lifespan. And what he basically said was, you know, if you're eating crap and then you eat less crap, you're going to do better. But if you're already eating healthy, nutritious food, the caloric restriction doesn't necessarily help. Again, this was just the one primate study. Are you familiar with that study or that? that, that Not the details, no, but I've definitely heard that that description as you just gave it. Um, and and it, it raises a, a, a really important point, and that is about the way we do experiments in the laboratory. Um, first of all, we're doing them for the most part, not the primates, but for worms and flies and so on and mice. We're using highly inbred strains that have become adapted to the laboratory over hundreds of generations, thousands of generations. and one thought is that, well, it may be easy to increase the lifespan of these maladaptive animals that are essentially, we've bred them to be sick because we've actually bred them to, you know, breed fast, uh, produce lots of offspring right. and so on. And that gets this idea of optimization. So if you could actually optimize human health, you get to a certain point. The interventions that we've come up with so far, are they going to do you any good at all? Mm. Um, you know, so there's a lot of talk right now about metformin as a potential uh, FDA approved drug that could be slowing lifespan in laboratory animals. And it, and, and it obviously improves lifespan if you have diabetes and you're being treated with metformin for diabetes. The question is, if you had an optimized population of, say, elite athletes who are doing everything right, would metformin actually have an effect in that population? It's a really interesting thought. And I mean, I think those of us who talk about this, truly believe you can go beyond the optimized state that 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 you know that you're you're not going to come up against the wall um but but it's 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 an issue i mean it's, yeah. it's something that i think we'll we'll face yeah it, it's a super interesting topic and i i'm glad you kind of made that distinction you know you talked about like the athletes there because it is an important point where 
a lot of times people, they kind of like focus on these small details. And I think it's really interesting, especially when you talk about a researcher such as yourself, we want to find out the mechanisms. We want to find out the small details and see if those allow us to learn so that we can manipulate. But yeah. when we're translating this into humans with what we currently know, you know, for instance, if you just bring up like sugar and people will talk about, obviously, you know, you get, there's every opinion out there on sugar, but in my opinion, you know, yes, if you're sedentary and you're eating a lot of sugar and you have a high HbA1c and, and all these issues, then yeah, you know, some sugar, extra sugar might not be ideal for you and your longevity and all that. But yeah. if you're talking about an elite athlete and they just did a workout and somebody's yeah. saying, oh, you should never eat sugar, that person's probably okay with a little sugar. And it's probably, I, I really doubt it's having any detrimental effect because they have optimized so many areas of their life that certain things, it's almost like a wash at the end of the day, and they're probably okay. Yeah, that that, that makes sense to me. And I, so I'm not a nutritionist, but I, I think we, I mean, as you know, we have so much that we can do in, in the nutrition area here to optimize things for people. I mean, just right. we're, we're, we're at baby steps in that right now. Yeah, yeah very interesting. So um, I want to talk about some specific compounds. Uh, one that I, I know is highly studied is vitamin D. That's one of the few, like I'm not a, a huge supplement guy. Um, I do mm -hmm. tend to offer people like, you know, diet advice, uh, training advice, things like that. I think that covers a lot of it, but certainly yeah. there, are, there are compounds that I think are really helpful. One, I don't know if you have any um, background with is curcumin. I just find that to be really interesting. It seems like a lot of anti-inflammatory effects. Mm -hmm. And the other one being vitamin D, it, just because so many people are deficient. Um, it was one that I was, uh, you know, for the standard people who don't know, Typically, 30 plus is, is recommended as far as like your blood levels. 40 yeah. to 60, some people seem to think is ideal. Mine were only 17 before mm, I ever supplemented yeah. anything. So yeah. I take about 5,000 I use a day, and that gets me in the mid 40s. Um, right. And it's something that I recommend people test. So maybe you can speak generally, and we can get more specifics on vitamin D for health. Sure, and, and, and again, I'm not a nutritionist or, sure. or an expert in human health, but but we 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 got into the vitamin D story by by going back to the worm. And um, we were actually looking for compounds that prevented a, an Alzheimer's related pathology in the worm. So if you drive expression of a, a neurotoxic peptide that's, uh, that's involved in Alzheimer's disease, the A-beta peptide, if you drive that in a worm, the worms get sick and they become paralyzed. And so it's quite easy to find compounds that prevent that paralysis and prevent that, that pathology. And so we, we did a screen of natural products and out pops vitamin D. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to my postdoc, Carla Mark, whose work this was, and said, you know, Carla, we're not going to work on vitamin D because A, everything must be known about vitamin D that ever existed, you know. Right, right. There's a paper every week and it's been studied forever. But we got curious and the reason we got curious was if you look at the, the profile of humans who are deficient in vitamin D, they're at elevated risk for some interesting conditions. So elevated risk for cancers elevated risk for diabetes, elevated risk for neurological disease. Right. And that was the real thing that got us. That, why would deficiency be involved in both neuro neurological disease and cancers? Very, very different conditions. Yeah. But as, as sort of people have been thinking about aging for a while, we looked at that and we said, that's the profile of aging. That, that's what happens with aging. You become, you, you have elevated risk for multiple very, very different disease conditions. Right. And so we thought, let's just go on and find out what we can find and use all the worm tools. And the, the, the final story of that was that vitamin D, yes, it, it did prevent the Alzheimer's pathology, but it was doing it by slowing aging in the worm. Mm -hmm. And we, we had some details about various pathways that are going on. So we started showing this data to uh, people who really did think about human aging, uh, actually including people at the National Institute of Medicine. And they really were um, taken by this because in some ways we know that what deficiency means for kids, it means rickets and we understand about calcium right. metabolism and so on. Deficiency in adults is much more complicated. This elevated risk for such different kinds of diseases didn't have a paradigm. So our suggestion was, well, well the paradigm is that deficiency is accelerated aging. And we've certainly got some traction, people thinking about that and how you might want to measure aging in clinical trials of vitamin D. And um, yeah, I, I think I, everything I read and what I hear is, is super important. Now, there's also the danger of toxicity. And I think it's worth talking to your physician about that as well. There are, sure. are rare cases where there's clearly been toxicity, uh, especially if what it says on the bottle isn't exactly what's in the bottle. And that's right. happened on a couple of occasions. Um, 
So we actually do study megadose uh, effects of vitamin D, and we, we do see detrimental effects even during, during neurological disease, something right. that, you know, at normal levels it protects against. So I think you want to think about a bell-shaped curve where uh, low is bad, uh, medium is good, and high is not good again. Um, so yeah, I, it's fascinating. And you know, finally, and I, I, there's a, a number of people around at the moment who are talking about deficiency as a risk factor for the more s serious forms of, of COVID-19. Really? Um, yeah, right, right. Yeah, I did yeah there's, there's one, one paper from China early on suggested uh, a deficiency resulted in an elevated risk of something like 78 fold. Wow. 78 fold for, for the, the worst symptoms for bad outcomes. Yeah. I mean, if that is replicated and is true, that's a stunning, uh, you know, a risk factor right there. Yeah. So, and, and we do know that, that many of the populations who are susceptible to the worst forms of the disease tend to be populations who don't have access to food, maybe are not seeing sunshine, are, are likely to be vitamin D deficient. Right. And, and I'm glad you mentioned, you know, the kind of like the bell curve there because. I think that's really important for people to remember something that's very common, unfortunately, with like mainstream media is that they will everything has to be sensationalized. Right. And so yeah. they'll say this compound was shown to do this terrible thing. And it's like, you know, I'm not disputing the study that shows that. But you could say, like you just said, you could say, wow, vitamin D causes neurological disease. And it's like, well, again, you have to look at the dose. Right. And yes. that is so crucial because there are so many compounds that I mean, I would imagine that most compounds, if you gave a high enough dose, are going to cause some problem, you know, Absolutely. and there's a there's a balance. And so that that obviously doesn't just speak to vitamin D. I mean, that's just kind of everything. And not to say that there aren't some things that are problematic, even in small doses, that there are certainly things that we'd want to avoid almost entirely. But I'm just glad you made that kind of broader point there, because I think it's important for people to remember. Yeah, when I was a kid, someone told me that potatoes could kill you if you ate enough of them. And so yeah. I was trying to kind of use that to get out of eating my potatoes. <laughs> right. Um, in terms of vitamin D, as far as it, certain things that I had read about it on that topic was that they can kind of turn on detoxification mechanisms, that they can prevent this age-related rise in protein solubility. Does that all yeah. kind of fall under that umbrella of aging that proper vitamin D levels can prevent? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We and others have seen um, a number of times when you activate detoxification mechanisms, that's a contributor to longevity in these simple laboratory experiments. And the, the protein insolubility, wow, that's, that's a, that goes back a while because it's been known that the, the, the factors or, or normal endogenous factors that help with protein folding or remove damaged proteins, that all those factors were also involved in longevity. And it so happened that, that we, we, we then went on to study, well, what proteins are getting into trouble during aging? What proteins are misfolding? And we're able to identify and our collaborators and other labs have been able to see the same, that there's thousands of proteins that actually, they kind of behave like neurotoxic proteins. They kind of fall out of conformation and they become sticky and they become toxic. Um, and so, so these thousands of proteins that are doing this are accumulating during normal aging, at least in the worm, we're looking at human samples now. And um, it seems to be really important for lifespan. So when we find compounds that prevent that accumulation, and we think they're doing that by activating the endogenous repair processes, when we see that, we also see lifespan extension. So we think these things are tightly coupled, longevity, yeah. uh, protein insolubility, and, and actually also the, 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 the features of, of a failure of protein um, uh, homeostasis in neurological disease, we think is probably connected to this generalized aging process as well. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I think the whole idea, I mean, when you look, and I'm certainly not a, an expert in biology, but just when you start to delve into certain proteins, how important they are. Um, one thing that was talked about, I know, uh, again, with Dr. Rhonda Patrick was heat shock proteins. And I don't know yeah. if that's something that you've looked at directly. But one of the things that I find interesting about that topic in general that we can touch on is when you look at these hormetic responses to stress, there yeah. are many examples where something that acutely is a problem, whether we're talking about, you know, heat shock proteins, inflammation, you know, where people will hear and chronically there's, there's a very big difference between a chronic stress and the acute stressor and the response to that. Uh, so maybe you could speak on that a little bit. 
Yeah, no, I think I think that's a really good description. And what we find is that short acute stresses are tend to be beneficial and longer chronic stresses are, are de detrimental. And uh, we 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 first noticed this in worms where we gave the worms little little bits of heat shock. We made them uncomfortable. They took the degrees of the incubator up for a while and lo and behold, they lived longer. Uh, but if we left them at the high temperature, then they died very, very quickly. So we thought, that's, that's interesting. Well, what's that doing? What's that heat shock doing? And there was a great deal of biology known about heat shock proteins and the fact that they're induced to protect proteins against unfolding during a stress. And so we made worms that made more heat shock proteins and they lived longer, even if you didn't heat shock them. So, really? yeah, so, so this idea of hormesis has been around forever. I mean, it goes back to um, accounts of uh, cancer rates following Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the fact, of course, that cancer rates were hugely elevated close to the, the epicenters of the explosions. But there was an observation and probably quite controversial to this day was that there was a, a circle. As far, if you got far enough away from the, the epicenter, then there was a circle of people that uh, pop, the population was experiencing lower cancer rates. And the idea was that, the, that, that there was a certain sweet spot of radiation there that was the population was being exposed to that probably induced DNA repair really? processes that reduced the incidence of cancer. Truly amazing. And, um, you know, I, I think we, we it's, it's certainly in the laboratory, it's extremely common that you can find small stresses that are going to extend lifespan. And I'm, I'm sure this absolutely relates to um, even even uh, socioeconomic differences in aging and disease rates based on right. chronic stress versus acute stress. Uh, because there's, there's really a continuum between the molecular processes and ch chaperones all the way through to psychosocial stress and right. if you if you look at the you know the biological markers of of inflammatory stress in certain populations that are exposed to psychosocial stress it's enormously high and not surprisingly that's where the mortality rates are higher as well yeah that's really interesting when you mentioned those with uh, more socioeconomic stress have higher inflammatory markers are you talking about like can you just kind of elaborate on that, like what inflammatory markers we're seeing? Oh, the whole panel, IL-6, IL-10, I mean, they just, really? I, I, yeah, I mean, actually, you know more, much more about this than I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, but I, you know, I, I know a physician in my hometown of Glasgow, for example, who measures uh, inflammation load across the population. And he's described it as you go from the west end of Glasgow to the east end, the west is the affluent part, and the east is a much poorer part of the city. As you go from uh, underground station to underground station, life expectancy is reduced by one and a half years on each station along the way until you get to the end where there's a, a 10, 10 year difference essentially. And that maps beautifully onto inflammation load. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly knew that lower socioeconomic status, you know, individuals had lower lifespan on average. Um, but I actually, I wasn't aware that it correlated so well with inflammatory markers. I think I might have lost you there. Yeah, and you know, one, one way to think about that is the, the, that sort of that sort of psychosocial. Oh, sorry. Sorry, the uh, connection just went out real briefly. It looks like okay. Looks like we're good though. Okay, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> uh, the correlation with the socioeconomic status and inflammation. Yeah, there was a good follow-up point to that. I can't remember what it was though. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one way to think about this is that that, that different groups of people um, with the health disparities are actually aging at different rates. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's a, it's an interesting lens to look at that issue, you know, where that the the, the reason that they're, they're being driven into higher rates of chronic disease is partly because they're actually aging faster. And as we improve in our ways to measure aging, which is still obviously a really difficult thing to do in, in, in any animal, to be honest. Um, but as we're able to do that with biomarkers more accurately, I imagine this picture will unfold of very different rates of aging amongst different groups of people. Yeah, yeah, that is a very interesting way to think about it. Um, one thing that you had kind of briefly mentioned, you said about the vitamin D and, and the levels that are actually in there versus what's reported. I actually think that's an important thing to mention because as a lot of people know, supplements are not necessarily regulated by the FDA. And so I do always recommend people get blood levels actually checked, one, to see if you even need it, and then two, to see if it's working for you and then you have the proper dosage. So I do think that's important and it's not an overly expensive test. Um, yeah. One of the other tests that I had recently checked for me was iron. 
And mm-hmm. so um, I've always been very low on iron and uh, my ferritin's low. Despite my diet, it just seems, um, you know, and I have some medical reason that might be, but I had considered for a while supplementing with iron. But yeah. one of my concerns was, you know, we do see higher levels of iron correlating with higher levels of cardiovascular disease. Um, and I believe you guys have found that higher levels of iron and other even metals can correlate with, I believe, Alzheimer's and other neurological issues. Is that the case? Yeah, and actually I can probably speak about my wife, Julie Anderson's work. She works in Parkinson's disease in, in mouse models. And she showed a number of years ago that, that neonatal feeding of iron was sufficient to, to blow out those neurons that are lost in Parkinson's, the dopaminergic neurons. And uh, other studies showing that you could protect against Parkinson's by expressing ferritin or, uh, or by taking a, a molecule that specifically burned, burned iron. So there's, there's, there's plenty of laboratory evidence. And also there's the accumulation of these metals, uh, elevated levels in, with, in people with neurological disease. So there's the correlative stuff and then the experimental animal stuff all points to the same thing. And for what it's worth in worms, if you feed worms a, a high level of iron in their diet, um, firstly, they don't live as long. And secondly, they have an acceleration of this protein insolubility we we're talking about. So proteins are misfolding, becoming insoluble. You can essentially take a 2D old worm. Worms live for about 20 days. You can take a 2D old worm, put it on an iron rich diet, and within two days, it looks like an 18 day old worm wow. on, its, on its proteome based on that, that feature of protein ins- insolubility. It really accelerates things. Wow. And I mean, I think, you know, that, that I think generally the idea of manipulating metals is a little scary because yeah. they're, they're just so required for so many reactions in our body. Um, but it does seem like there's a general appreciation and accumulation of metals during aging is is not necessarily a good thing. If, if we could find ways to regulate, you know, especially in specific tissues, the levels of metals, I think it'd be great. And that's a sort of under, understudied area, and it's an understudied approach to even neurological disease because I think people are just, you know, wow, can we do that? Can we ever do that? Yeah, I, I mean, like you said, metals are involved in like everything, you know, every cell, I mean, every like mechanism, there, there's so much there. So, yeah. and I know you, you know, obviously you said you're not a nutritionist, but I, I just wonder if to some degree, you know, I would never, I would always want to look at epidemiological data as a star and say, okay, so obviously a lot of these foods that have high iron and, and high metals are healthy foods, you know, a lot of, um, mm-hmm. you know, potentially meats and plant foods and everything are high in them. Yeah. Well, I would also wonder, again, going back to supplementation, maybe those are the foods, and this is, again, to some degree me speculating, I would imagine that if you're eating a you know whole food, healthy diet, you're probably going to have a hard time getting excessive amounts of metals, and per- right. perhaps the form that they're in will be you know potentially maybe more healthy, but I would think that for some of these people who are maybe mega dosing multivitamins and things like that, potentially that that could lead to problems. Again, I'm not sure if we have hard evidence for that, but just from what you're saying, uh, you know, getting these concentrated doses of them, I would imagine is maybe not the best. I I completely agree. I mean, I just everything that we see in, in the lab tells us that we we we've got to be careful about excess whether we think something is good or not you know deficiency is bad and excess is bad I, I think that's going to be a general rule um i mean interesting with vitamin d you know in in the worm we could never find a toxic dose but I, that doesn't lead me to then say that anyone right. should be taking any more than what you, you you know maybe you're doing not being an md i don't give advice but i i remember um janice schwartz who's actually an expert in um, doing clinical trials on vitamin D in, in geriatric uh, settings. And, and Jana said, look, you know, even if you don't get tested, take a thousand units a day. If you're deficient, yeah. it'll help. And, you know, so even if you don't get over that, that hurdle of going and asking your physician and getting tested, right. a thousand units is probably, probably a good thing for you. Probably and, 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 so. certainly, and certainly harmless. Yeah. You had just mentioned there that in worms, you weren't able to find a, a harmful dose of vitamin D. But earlier you had mentioned that high levels of vitamin D I believe you mentioned that they can cause neurological issues. So was that not in worms or that was was not in worms? That that was quoting that was quoting studies in humans where there's been these unfortunate cases where that that you know there's you know a thousand fold higher levels of vitamin D in the tablets than was on the table, and then you know someone presents with all sorts of horrible conditions and eventually they they traced it back to megadose vitamin D. Oh wow, that's unfortunate. Um, So. 
Oh, I and I should say one one of the things I was talking about was some unpublished, very preliminary data in mouse models that we actually are doing with with Julie Anderson's lab, where we're looking at mega doses in in that setting, and the early indications are that it, it's not good. Okay. Uh, it could exacerbate the disease, but very preliminary. Gotcha. Um, regarding the uh, you're talking about like the bombing and that that radiation, so that's that's really interesting. I'm sure it's hard to get super concrete data on something like that, but have they not then tried to replicate that concept and given small amounts of radiation to see if it helps against future cancer rates? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been of interest. It's been of interest to the Department of Energy, for example, who mm -hmm. funded this kind of research. And, um, you know, the, 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 the general idea is, is hermesis again, that giving a small um, dose of something that otherwise you would imagine would be terrible yeah. is maybe beneficial. Now, I remember, being, you know, saying something like that and being taken apart in one of the British newspapers for even really? suggesting that, that, you know, exposure to radiation is would be in any way beneficial. I get that. I mean, we should not be, you know, presenting, you know, the, to, to the public the idea that toxins are good for you or radiation is good for you. Uh, that just goes well beyond the data. But as an experimental scientific idea, I think it, it's really worth investigating. And I think well, I think we'll find out many of the, the interventions, the chemical interventions in aging in, in the animal models probably have this some sort of hormetic aspect to them, where they're inducing defense systems. They're coming in, it's being detected as a toxin, the defense systems are being induced, and that's clearing up the protein damage, uh, it's cleaning other toxins out of the cell, and, and essentially the defense systems overcome the small amount of stress that you've given it, and then you go on to be beneficial. I, I think a lot right. of things will work that way. I mean, even even the like the, our most favorite compound that we work with and we've published really nice papers on, right from the get-go we said, this could be working as a hormetic agent. This could actually be detected as a toxin, first of all, and it's the response to that presence of a toxin that gives the beneficial effects. And what compound was that you were referring to? That was thioflavin T. Uh, so it's just a, a you know really solid compound that extends lifespan, promotes protein homeostasis again, prevents you know the A beta protein, the Alzheimer's protein from aggregating. So it's doing lots and lots of good things. But if you look at the profile of, of genes that are turned on after exposure, there they are. There's the detoxification yeah. genes again. Uh, there's the molecular chaperones coming coming up. So I, I think that's just going to be a general picture. Do you have any other compounds that you are most favorably looking upon for future research, even to be applied to humans for longevity? Yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we're we watching very carefully uh, another National Institutes of Health program called the Intervention Testing Program. And it was set up many, many years ago to um, find compounds that reproducibly extended lifespan in a mouse with an absolute goal of finding candidates that someday could be, you know, in clinical trials. And their big success story going back to 2007 was the discovery of rapamycin. Right. So this was, again, an FDA-approved drug, which uh, in the mouse extended lifespan in all three labs. So really beautiful result published in Nature. And that's inspired thousands of subsequent publications looking at rapamycin in different disease states. And the general picture being that, yeah, this, this is improving not just you know, an inflammation or something else, but really it's across the board improving lots and lots of different functions, including cardiovascular disease and so on, neurological disease. So I, I this is, and this goes back to, I know this is a very simplistic picture, but it's, it seems that aging is a common risk factor for multiple very different kinds of human diseases. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that could be that aging is is not just a risk factor, but a cause. And I, I think many people uh, of your generation are comfortable with that. But yeah. people of my generation are still going, what do you mean cause? You know, what, aging doesn't cause disease. Um, but we think it does. We genuinely think that there are conserved aging processes that drive normal, so normal aging processes right. that, that drive pathology that leads to different disease states. So then you think, well, OK, so if you can intervene in aging, what does that mean for multiple diseases? And it, and it means a lot. It means that you might expect to find something that slows aging in a worm that protects against, you know, neurological disease and, and cancer and bone loss and cardiovascular disease. And right. I think that there's emerging evidence, some of it where we and others at the Buck Institute are publishing this year, um, that, that, you know, give, give a glant, glimpse of that. And it's really, especially in the mouse models, there's presenting clear evidence that 
single compounds that slow aging that are discovered in simple animals like worms can actually affect different domains of aging and improve health in, in different different ways. So right. that, that's super exciting if you think about it. I mean, if we yeah. find compounds in worms and flies and yeast and all, all these things and then get them to a point where you can see benefits in multiple domains of health, that, that means that these things are, are really strong candidates or, or compounds like them to, to be enrolled into some sort of human clinical trials. Because then you're looking at multiple outcomes as well. In those human, human trials, you, you don't need to focus on Alzheimer's disease or cardiovascular disease. You can look at overall outcomes for health. Um, not something that's easy if you're a, 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 you know, a trying to make money out of something, you generally right. have to focus on an indication area. Sure. Certainly you do for FDA approval, but just that general idea that, that there's a pipeline now from basic biology of aging as a kind of science project into something where we're, we're finding meaningful candidates for human interventions is, wow. Yeah, no, I think I think it's super fascinating. I had heard more recently about rapamycin and that's definitely an area that I think will be interesting to see more come out. Um, I guess one thing I'd wanna wrap up on is you know, if you talk to different researchers, some people will say that they think for the most part, human lifespan is is near maxed out that, you know, a lot of the increases we've seen are from child mortality going down and things like mm -hmm. that. Some people think that we're going to greatly expand lifespan in a, even a short period of time. So looking forward, where do you fall in that category? If you had to speculate, you know, if you said 100 years from now, where do you think average human lifespan would be? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that scientists are that good at predicting the future, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I appreciate those two schools of thought that we have seen increases in life expectancy in an exponential fashion since 1840. You know, it's incredible. Um, sorry, a linear fashion. Um, but, but, but what you see in the lab really challenges the notion that lifespan is fixed. And I, I, I just I don't have a really good idea of why human lifespan would be fixed when all these other uh, animals were able to would take much further, you know, and yeah. I, I think that goes beyond optimization, to be honest, when you're seeing five-fold increases in a lab animal. So, so yeah, uh, 100 years, that's tough. I mean, what I would hope is that we would all be creeping toward the, the, the lifespan or, the, or the, the sort of the life of some of our centenarians. So these very extremely rare people, if you think about it, who make it to 100 and are healthy, uh, they may have sidestepped or been cured for various diseases, but they've made it to 100 and they're out in their garden and they're, you know, volunteering for the other local hospital and they're looking after their great, great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And you see these people and you know, well, it's, it's possible that humans can be like that. And you, it would be great to think that we had increased life expectancy or actually for me, more importantly, health to the point where many, many more people were looking at that 100 years and thinking, yeah, that's, that's attainable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's attainable uh, it, with health, accompanied by good health. So um, I, I don't, I, I can't make any statement about the thousand year lifespan right. or any of these things. I just don't think we were, we have enough knowledge to really extrapolate like that. Um, and I'm not sure that really helps. I mean, what concerns us today is geriatric psychiatric wards uh, with, you know, ever increasing people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're faced with failure after failure to develop therapies for neurological disease, billions of dollars being spent, taking more traditional approaches. So I would like to think that we have made incredible progress in those areas and that we had come at this from an aging angle, found that aging is a linchpin for multiple diseases, found ways to intervene, and lo and behold, you can start to think about reducing the number of geriatric psychiatric wards because the cases are beginning to disappear or be pushed back. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, I used to joke that, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at people, like, you know, let's say before the polio vaccine came, right? Like it was this horrible thing and now it's just something that we don't really think about. But right. imagine if you were the person, if you died like the year before the polio vaccine came out, it's like, man, you just missed it. And I feel like our technology and medicine is advancing and it's amazing. I feel like we're going to be just a couple generations away from that generation that has these like amazing breakthroughs and not that obviously we should appreciate the amazing breakthroughs that we've already had, but they're like, I just imagine, you know, it's going to be our great grandkids or something and they're going to, it's just like, we just missed it, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. And I, 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 when I was 
came into this field, there was a, 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 firm, a someone someone who was donating money into the field and and uh, they said, well, I, I know this is too late for me, but um, and at that time I thought, no way, you know, we're moving faster than that. You know, this is not yeah. too late for anyone. Um, but but I, I, I see that things can can take a little bit of time and, and you're right. I mean, technology advancement is the critical area here because my my imagination for where we could be in terms of human health span is limited by my imagination of technology. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so let's see, I, I would love to hang around long enough to see something dramatic happen in this field. Yeah, totally, and totally. I, I, I think it will. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gordon Lithgow, for coming on. And I just want to say, actually, let me, let me say that again, because I know I got the name wrong there. So I'll, I'll cut that out there. Um, <laughs> thank you again so much, Dr. Gordon Lithgow, for coming on. Uh, this was really great to talk about. You know, it was a little bit different than some of the topics I've had in the strictly health and like fitness field. To me, I thought this was really interesting and give people some different perspectives and give them a start to look further into these areas. Uh, so where can people find more of your stuff? Um, please visit the Buck Institute's website. Uh, and one reason for doing that, that's where my lab is. Uh, but we also routinely post um, general articles on health, uh, latest scientific findings and so on. Um, I always point people towards the Mayo um, and for natural products and, and nutrients, uh, the Linus Pauli Institute website is an excellent source as well. Perfect. And if Thank you're you. in California and we can do it, uh, uh, please contact us and come, come visit the Buck. That's to all your all your listeners. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure everybody will appreciate that. And I will have a link for everything down below. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much indeed. So this is great. Let me just stop the recording there.